What's up everybody? I'm Dr. Garrett Rossi, a board certified psychiatrist making mental health content here on YouTube. And if you're new to this community, I would love to make you a member of it. It really helps me to know that you guys are getting value from this information. And if you're a returning viewer, thank you so much for all of the support. Now today's story is going to be an interesting one. I'm going to talk about a medication that's very commonly prescribed in psychiatry, but really, what is the evidence for this medication's use in psychiatric disorders? Because that's really what we want to know. We want to know, is this medication effective for the things that people are supposedly saying it is? And obviously, as scientists, we're going to go to the data and we're going to figure that out. So today's video topic is going to be gabapentin or Neurontin, the most commonly prescribed off-label medication in psychiatry. So this is one that's super commonly prescribed, and we're gonna go through all that data to tell you why this became a thing, and what you can do if you're taking this medication or prescribing this medication, and you're not really sure if it's effective or useful. So that's the topic for today. We're gonna to go ahead and get right into it here. All right, guys, so let's go through a quick, brief introduction to how we got to this point with gabapentin and what are some of the actual FDA-approved indications for this medication, because it's important to know what it's really approved for. Now, gabapentin is approved by the FDA for three specific indications. The first one is to prevent and control partial seizures. So it was originally designed as an anticonvulsant to prevent and control partial seizures. Another area where it was found to be very effective was to relieve nerve pain following shingles. So if somebody develops shingles, they can have what's called post-herpatic neuralgia, which is a pain syndrome that occurs after the development of shingles. So this is something else that it's been useful for, and to add to that, diabetic peripheral neuropathy could also be considered an indication here. And the third one is to treat moderate to severe restless leg syndrome. So it is approved for restless leg syndrome. Now, unfortunately, in the United States here, less than 1%, let that sink in for a minute, less than 1% of the prescriptions written for gabapentin are for any of the above listed FDA approvals. So most of the prescriptions are off-label. In fact, much of this off-label prescribing is done in none other than Oh, it kills me, but it's true. Psychiatry and substance use disorders. So all this off-label prescribing is largely in the areas of psychiatry and substance use disorders. Now, we were first alerted to some of the misleading marketing that was going on by Pfizer, the company that originally designed this medication, and they actually paid a huge fine, an unprecedented fine, a few years ago. And that was $2.3 billion. So they were fined $2.3 billion for misleading clinicians and having misleading marketing campaigns trying to get doctors to prescribe this medication for things it wasn't indicated for. Now, gabapentin is often thought of by a lot of doctors as a benign medication, a medication that doesn't cause many problems, and it does address some symptoms that people commonly think about. So some of the things that doctors will tell you that they consider this for are migraine, chronic lower back pain, fibromyalgia, opioid use disorder, anxiety disorders of various types, including social phobia and panic disorder, and of course the mood disorders like bipolar disorder. Now there's now mounting evidence that this medication is maybe not as safe as we thought it was. People assumed for many years that prescribing this medication was relatively easy and not a problem, but we have a lack of quality data really indicating that, and today what we're going to do is review the safety, efficacy, and use of gabapentin in various psychiatric disorders. So in order for you guys to have a good understanding of what gabapentin does, we should know what the mechanism of action is and what it does in our bodies. So gabapentin functions by binding to these alpha-2 delta subunits of voltage-gated calcium channels, and that's a little bit technical and you probably don't need to know all of it, but really the important point is, is that it's that binding to these voltage gating calcium channels that leads to the anti-pain, anti-convulsant, anxiolytic properties that are supposedly or theoretically occurring when someone uses gabapentin. Now, although it's structurally related to GABA, which is our major inhibitory neurotransmitter, commonly talked about with medications like benzodiazepines or barbiturates, there is no direct interaction 
with GABA-A or GABA-B receptors when somebody is using gabapentin. So it's an important point to know that although it's structurally related to GABA, it does not interact with GABA-A or B receptors. You might be wondering then, why is there such an increase in the prescribing practices of gabapentin in the United States? And that's a good question. And one of the things we can certainly point to is the opioid epidemic. So this opioid epidemic in the United States has been going on for a long time. It's caused significant problems, lots of morbidity and mortality, and it's really drove much of the prescribing. What we've actually seen is a 64% increase in GABA per, gabapentin prescriptions from 2012 to 2016. And some of this has to do with our policymakers searching for safer alternatives for pain management. So instead of prescribing somebody an, an addictive medication like, say, a, an opioid of some sort, right? Uh, Percocet, for example, we can prescribe somebody gabapentin and treat their pain. Now, although, unfortunately, policymakers have good intentions sometimes, they don't understand the data, and they really are prescribing things that don't make a whole lot of sense, or recommending we start prescribing things that don't make a whole lot of sense. So although lacking any data for the treatment of chronic pain, Gabapentin was elevated in its role because of several factors. One of those factors was the cost. It's not a, it's, it's no longer a formulary medication. It's now a generic, so it's relatively cheap medication to prescribe. It has a non-controlled status at the federal level. So again, this is not a controlled substance at the federal level. It has evidence in neuropathic pain, which you might argue could be extrapolated to other types of pain such as chronic lower back pain. And it had, like I said, what people considered a relatively benign side effect profile. However, the risk of gabapentin abuse is becoming more and more apparent. People are abusing this medication. I see it all the time. And we're, as, and we're seeing that abuse increase as more prescriptions are written. Now, the risk of adverse effects was prevalent when you combine this medication with other CNS depressants, such as opioids. And many people who are struggling with opioid use disorder might be prescribed gabapentin, but will still return to use at some point during their recovery. So the exact thing that gabapentin set out to replace opioids, right, is the thing that's being combined and potentially leading to significant risk factors. Now, approximately 15 to 22% of people with an existing substance use disorder abuse gabapentin. So people who have existing substance use disorders and you prescribe them gabapentin are at a significantly increased risk of abusing or misusing gabapentin. Those who overuse gabapentin were found to be at increased risk for all cause or drug related hospital stays and emergency visits. So people on gabapentin are more likely to end up in the hospital. So not only is this not really helping treat the person's pain or, to pr or provide any benefit in opioid use disorder, it's also increasing the risk of those people being hospitalized or visiting emergency rooms for things like altered mental status and, re and respiratory depression. So the off-label prescribing of gabapentin comes with risk that we are now discovering. Let's begin our discussion on some of the disorders that we would commonly be seeing gabapentin prescribed for in psychiatry. Probably the most common one that I see in clinical practice is for the use in anxiety disorders, specifically things like generalized anxiety disorder. So let's look at what the evidence is for generalized anxiety disorder as well as other types of anxiety disorders when somebody is being prescribed gabapentin. Now, Gabapentin's use in anxiety disorder unfortunately does not have a lot of evidence. There are two, just two, randomized controlled trials that were industry sponsored and there was only a total of 172 participants in both of those trials. So a total of 172 in two trials. These are relatively small but well, well designed studies and they really provide very limited evidence in my opinion having reviewed them that gabapentin is effective in anxiety disorders. The first study was published in 1999 and it looked at the use of gabapentin in social anxiety disorder. So not even generalized anxiety disorder, it looked at social anxiety disorder. We had 69 participants. They were randomized to receive placebo or gabapentin somewhere in the range of 900 to 3600 milligrams per day for a total of 14 weeks. 
And what the authors concluded was a significant reduction in social anxiety was observed over the 14-week period. And the conclusion was that, well, more randomized control trials are needed to, to prove this and to uh, confirm that these results are adequate. So that's the first study. The other study actually set everything up pretty much the same. It was done by the same author, again, industry-sponsored. They looked at panic disorder. So again, no one looked at generalized anxiety disorder, they looked at panic disorder. Now, this study dosed the gabapentin the same way, the only difference being that it only was carried out for eight weeks and not 14 weeks. And the results, again, indicated that gabapentin was effective for severe panic disorder. So people with severe panic disorder who scored very highly on screening seem to do well on this medication. The one thing we notice is that neither of these studies, again, focused on generalized anxiety disorder, which I would say is the most common reason I see this prescribed. And these studies have not been replicated and no one else bothered to do any additional randomized controlled trials. Of note, there is far more evidence for the use of pregabalin. This comes from eight randomized controlled trials in anxiety disorders. And in Europe, it actually does have regulatory approval for generalized anxiety disorder. So if you're going to prescribe pregabalin or gabapentin, which are you know similar classes of medication, you would be much better off and much more on evidence. So off-label, on evidence, that's an important point too. We're prescribing off-label, on evidence, if you use pregabalin in those patients that you wanted to treat difficult anxiety disorders. All right, evidence for use in bipolar disorder. So I'm going to burst the bubble here right off the bat and a few other bubbles, so I'm going to be upfront about that. While some people, some even some doctors, some psychiatrists, right, believe that anticonvulsants are mood stabilizers, so it's a class effect. Every medication that is an anticonvulsant also has mood stabilizing properties. Now that could not be further from the truth. This is a crazy idea that these doctors have put in their head and it's really not good practice because, again, it's not on evidence. Gabapentin has never been proven in a randomized controlled trial to treat mania or any other aspect of bipolar disorder, aside from possibly as adjunctive treatment to another mood stabilizer. But again, this is really not good data and it's only one study. So I really would say that if you're thinking about prescribing gabapentin or you are taking gabapentin for bipolar disorder, it's doing nothing for you and you're really putting yourself at risk to the potential side effects. Likewise, I'm going to burst the bubbles on two other medications, Toparamate or Topamax, also called Dopamax because of the cognitive problems associated with it at higher doses, and Oxcarbazepine, which is similar to Carbamazepine, but again, not the same medication. Both of these have been thought of as potential mood stabilizing drugs, but they are not. They both performed poorly in studies, and they do not have any efficacy or evidence in bipolar disorder. So simply put, if you are on any of those three medications, gabapentin, oxcarbazepine, toparamate, and that's being used as your primary mood stabilizer, and you have a confirmed diagnosis of bipolar disorder, consider other options like lithium because these medications are not effective. All right, guys, so I'm going to talk about the use of gabapentin in the area where I think it actually has some pretty reasonable evidence. And that is for alcohol use disorder and cannabis use disorder, but again, more so alcohol use disorder, the studies are much better there. Now, part of the reason we're in this mess with gabapentin is because we're prescribing it for pain management, right? We're trying to treat addiction in, in some way with gabapentin or replace addictive substances with gabapentin. And we really were not very successful with that, right? It's not great for pain, but it does have a role in alcohol use disorder. In fact, the American Psychiatric Association decided to add gabapentin as a second line treatment for alcohol use disorder. And that was because patients who were using gabapentin reported fewer heavy drinking days, so it reduces the number of heavy drinking days, and the effect size was in the moderate range, somewhere around 0.4. There is also some indication that gabapentin improves sleep quality, specifically deep sleep or slow wave sleep that is usually known as the restorative sleep that we get. And we know that alcohol has bad effects or negative effects on people's sleep architecture and that it can increase the number of 
nighttime awakenings as well. So when someone's coming off of alcohol or reducing their alcohol intake, they are likely to have a sleep disturbance. The dose for alcohol use disorder is somewhere in the 300 to 3600 milligram range in divided doses, usually three times per day. And the, most patients will settle out around 900 milligrams per day in three divided doses. Now, one area where I've seen gabapentin used, and some people absolutely swear by it, some doctors absolutely swear by it, is they'll use gabapentin for the treatment of alcohol withdrawal. That will be in place of things like phenobarbital, which is a barbiturate, or benzodiazepines such as Ativan, or chloro chlorodiazepoxide. That's another one that's commonly used. There were a few seizures though in the gabapentin group. So when they look, when you look at these studies and you look at this evidence, there were some people who developed seizures when using gabapentin as the primary withdrawal agent. And although it wasn't significant enough to raise big concerns, I think it's best that we leave gabapentin for those who have lower dependence on alcohol and have less time heavily drinking because there's always that risk that they could have a seizure. Now you might be asking Dr. Rossi if I'm going to use this to prevent alcohol withdrawal, what am I going to do and how am I going to do it? So a typical taper for alcohol withdrawal would look something like this. You would start the patient on 1200 to 2400 milligrams per day in three divided doses. So you divide that number up again, probably using the higher end 2400 milligrams if the person has more severe dependence. You would taper that to 600 milligrams per day, probably 300 twice a day over the course of the next four to seven days. So over the course of four to seven days, you go down from 1200 or 2400 to 600 milligrams per day in divided doses. And the you would be watching for objective signs of alcohol withdrawal, and you should have Ativan available or something other than Ativan, say, some type of benzodiazepine, let's just say, to avoid a seizure should it develop. So you wanna be mindful that somebody could still have a problem on this medication potentially, and you gotta be mindful of what you would do in the event that happens. The next thing you would do is you would taper by 300 milligrams per day over the next two to three days until the medication was completely off. At that point, the patient would have completed the alcohol withdrawal protocol. So this can all be done over you know seven to 10 days, give or take, depending on how the patient is responding. The only other piece I want to touch on here is cannabis use disorder. And like I said, there's a major gap in treatment availability. We don't have any FDA approved medications for cannabis use disorder. We also know that it's sometimes very difficult to treat and that rehabs are not very excited about bringing patients in for that reason. So in cannabis use disorder, there is some limited data. We have a single study that showed improvement in withdrawal symptoms, as well as a reduction in cannabis use and improved executive function, so improved cognition, with when somebody is prescribed gabapentin for cannabis use disorder. But this is not really enough to recommend gabapentin on a regular basis in clinical practice for every patient dealing with cannabis use disorder. It is something to keep in your back pocket in the event you need it. And it's important to note here as well, when we're talking about substance use disorders, that gabapentin has failed completely failed, bombed out in multiple trials, multiple clinical trials involving cocaine, amphetamine, benzodiazepine, and opioid use disorder. So again, gabapentin not very effective for the treatment of cocaine, methamphetamine, benzodiazepine, or opioid use disorders. It's dangerous to combine gabapentin with opioids due to the risk of respiratory depression, as we discussed earlier in the video. Right, let's have a quick word on gabapentin and chronic back pain, because this is an indication that I see many patients come to me with, and they have a history of sciatica, or they have a history of herniated disc in their back, lower back specifically, and they come in on gabapentin because supposedly it treats lower back pain. Now there's actually a total of eight studies, including a systematic review and meta-analysis to assess pain relief in patients with chronic lower back pain. So there's actually quite a bit of studies. People really did try to get this pushed through. And what we end up seeing here is that when you pull the data together and you look at not only the individual studies, but also the meta-analysis and systematic review, you find that gabapentin demonstrated minimal improvement in pain compared to placebo. So the ultimate conclusion is that it really doesn't work for chronic lower back pain and that there was an increased 
risk of adverse side effects, including dizziness, fatigue, and visual disturbances. So again, there's risk with minimal benefit over placebo. It would not make sense to prescribe gabapentin for chronic back pain. You guys are probably curious about the adverse effects. So the most common side effects include things like sedation, fatigue, dizziness, imbalance, tremor, and visual changes. So those are the things that are commonly seen, and those are the ones that we wanna watch out for if somebody is indeed taking these medications. Let's talk quickly about dosing because I think there's some important points here. As I've already stated in the video, you have to take this medication at least three times a day, and that has to do with gabapentin's short half-life. So the half-life of gabapentin is only six hours. So if you want the medication to remain in the person's plasma at a relatively steady state, you're going to need to dose it more than once a day. So that makes it inconvenient for patients. And often my patients will forget to take a medication if they have to take it more than once a day. So this already creates some barriers to the treatment. The kinetics of gabapentin are also what we call nonlinear. So these are not linear kinetics, which means that the blood levels do not rise consistently. For example, if somebody takes a 900 milligram dose at night, let's say, of gabapentin, only 540 milligrams is absorbed. And the reason that this is nonlinear kinetics is because the transporters responsible for absorbing gabapentin in the GI tract are actually easily oversaturated. So these transporters that will absorb the medication are overly saturated and they limit the amount of medication that can be absorbed. So you get this nonlinear kinetics, which is important to note because again, if somebody's taking a high dose of this medication, they think they're getting all of that medication into their body. They're actually not because these transporters become easily oversaturated. So in conclusion here, I just wanna say that while there are very good reasons to consider prescribing gabapentin, many of the common reasons cited in clinical practice lack the appropriate evidence to support using this medication. For example, generalized anxiety disorder lacks any real evidence, chronic lower back pain, as we stated, lacks any real good evidence. So these, this medication is still over-prescribed and prescribed off-label, but it's also off-evidence. So not only is it off-label, it's off-evidence because we don't have any data to support it in these disorders. It's best to stick with the FDA approved indications. If you're prescribing it off label, I would consider using it in things such as alcohol use disorder because I feel like at least there's some reasonable data. If you were treating somebody with anxiety and you wanted to use one of these medications, you would be much more on evidence to prescribe pregabalin over gabapentin because pregabalin actually has eight trials and some really good data for anxiety. It's like I said, indicated in Europe for generalized anxiety disorder. So if you're going to choose one of these medications to treat anxiety, it's best to go with pregabalin. And of course, like I said, the alcohol use disorder also has some pretty good evidence. If the patient fails other things like acamprosat, naltrexone, and other treatment modalities first, I would use this again as a second line option to treat alcohol use disorder. And we can see whether or not anyone does additional trials for cannabis use disorder but I would not be prescribing that on a regular basis for people with cannabis use disorder. So I'm gonna hold the video there. I would love to see your comments and questions in the section below, and I'm gonna to try to get to them as soon as I can. It's always difficult, and thank you so much for watching. If you have not subscribed to the channel and have not liked the video, please do so. It really helps me to keep this thing going.